O come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. God of Jacob, fierce and great, you lift your voice to speak. The earth, it bows, and all the mountains move into the sea. O Lord, you know the hearts of men, and still you let them live. O God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win. O God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win. Those are lyrics from a Shane and Shane song called Lord of Hosts. And those lyrics specifically come from Psalm 46. And I love that song and I love that psalm because it is so descriptive of this immense and great power of God. A, a power that is on display and a power that is at work on our behalf. Today is the first day of the Christian calendar. It's the first day of Advent, a time wherein we are very intentional about anticipating the return of Jesus as those who anticipated his birth. And today what we want to do is acknowledge the great power of God in a lot of ways, the same way in which those who witnessed the coming of Jesus acknowledged it. That's going to be our focus for today. Just a declaration and acknowledging of God's great power and then also a sobering reminder. But the very fact that this great God who is, is on display for all of us actually cares for us. And he loves us. And so today, we're going to light the first candle of Advent. This candle lit represents the light that came into the world. And that light that came into the world, this is the message. It declares to us that God is the God Almighty. We're talking about the God who spoke to Abraham in Genesis 17. and says, I am El Shaddai. That is God Almighty, or the most powerful one. And so today we're going to light this candle and acknowledging this great power that is on display now. But we're lighting it in anticipation of his return. We're in this power. Oh, this power is going to be on display like no other time. that you pour your spirit on our efforts today so that the things we do together will help reorient our lives in light of Christ's return. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The great power of, of God, if we could just be still, we would know that he is God. For the message is loud and clear. If we could just hear. Creation itself is screaming in our faces. Paul says this in Romans 8, 
verses 19 through 21, he says, Even creation is waiting for the day where God will reveal who his real children are. And he goes on to say that creation even suffers as we do, but, as, but creation also has the same hope that we have as it, he says this, as it looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. But until then, the psalmist declares in Psalm 19, 1 through 6, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. And he says, it does this, and day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They, they speak, he says, without a sound or word. But yet their voice, the voice is loud and clear, yet it's never heard. Their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. And this is it. That God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It burst forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. I like that analogy. It rejo- Think about that for a moment. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. And this is a description of the declaration that the creation screams if we would but just hear. But it's not only creation. What about the words of Isaiah and Ezekiel and John? We have in Isaiah 6 this vision of God. In verse 1 he says this, speaking of God, He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of His robe it filled the temple. Do you realize how big? Look, ain't no woman or bride who's ever had a long train compares to what Isaiah sees here. It fills, he says, the temple. And attending, he says in verse 2, to him were mighty seraphim. Just, just, just think angels. Just think angels and whatever you think when you think angels. Mighty seraphim were attending to him. And it was like, he says, they were covered with wings. And he says it was like their feet were covered with wings and then they had massive wings where they, they, they flew and then they had, like, they had wings over their faces. And he says they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole world is filled with his glory. And then he says this, their voices. Now, These are those who attend to this immense, awesome, and powerful God that creation declares. These are just the voices of those who attend to Him. And He says, their voices, notice in verse 4, shook the temple to its foundation. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation and the entire building was filled with smoke. Now imagine what would happen if that's what happens to the seemingly insignificant small beings that attend to them. And they speak. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28, he speaks of this throne. He says, in this throne, it looked like this. He said, it looked like, it looked like it was created out of blue sapphire. I love this. Now, when you read, when I read these things, I want you to think about the different language that they use to describe what they're seeing. And in times, it seems like they're struggling to find words that, that really are adequate. And sometimes when you read in scripture, you see different pictures because people are in awe. And when you're in awe, you try to think. In awe. And so this is what he says. It was like this, this throne, and it looked like it was made of blue sapphire. And on this throne, high above, was a figure. Notice the language he uses here. The figure whose appearance resembled a man. What does that tell you? He can't see. It's bright. 
There's this immense glory and awesomeness surrounding it. And he's going to give you some depictions of this. And he's like, it kind of, it resembled a man. I'm trying to, it was like he was built this throne and it was like blue sapphire. And it was like, I saw a figure and it, it kind of looked like a man. And this is what he says. He describes him. For what appeared to be his waist up. He looked like gleaming amber, flickering like a fire. And from his waist down, he looked like a burning flame, shining with splendor. And then all around him, he says, and so, so, so you, he sees this throne and there's just this immense, immense glory that's projecting around, out, out from it. And, but he can kind of make some things up. And then he says, it was like it was consumed. All around him was a glowing halo. It was like, like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what, he says, the glory of the Lord looked like to me. And when I saw it, did you notice, notice what he says? And when I saw it, I fell on my face. What about Revelation 4? John, John says... This is his throne. And then there's the one sitting on it was as brilliant as gemstones. And, and, and even around his throne, there was a glow of emerald circle. You see, that's like this essence of light. He was surrounded by elders. He says, clothed in, in white with gold crowns. And so these are important people, important beings. And the, the area around the throne flashed with lightnings and, and thunder. It was just an awesome scene. And then the, the front of the throne, he says, was lit up with torches. And the floor was like a sea of glass. I've always liked it depiction because it represents God on his throne, all seeing. So the floor was like, in front of his throne was like a sea of glass. And the scene was, was occupied, he says, by these most powerful and amazing and, and wondrous beings and he says day after day and night after night they keep saying things like holy 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 is the lord god the almighty one el shaddai the one who is and who is still to come and in acknowledgement of this the elders lay down their crowns before the throne and they say you are worthy O oh Lord of our God, to receive glory and honor and power. And so when you, you read those descriptions, and those are just three from Scripture. You read those descriptions, and, and, and you see this world and the message that the world declares. And if we could just be still just for a moment, and we, could, we would know that He is God. And so can we collectively all agree at this point that there is a being that is so powerful and awesome in heaven that if we saw him, we would be in awe. So much so that scripture tells us over and over again that when people found themselves in the presence of this awesomeness, you know what they did? They fell down on their faces and they laid still like they were dead. They didn't know what to do. They were overcome with what we would refer to as fear. It's awesomeness, power. They just, just overcomes one where, you know those movies where, you know, the chick is being chased by the guy and he's trying to kill her, and then she's running, and she stops, and she turns around, and she just screams instead of running out of the house. That, that fear. But more than that, this, this sense of just being overwhelmed with what you're seeing, that you can't do nothing else but fall face down. There's other descriptions, in, especially in the book of Revelation, where when people see this glory of God, all they can do and all they want to do is run and hide. They think it's going to consume them. In fact, there's a description over and over again in Scripture that when people, people see this glory of God, they, they question and say, who can, who can handle this presence? Like, who can be in the presence of God? Who can handle it? Even God tells Moses, you don't know what you're asking for. You can't handle being in my presence. So remember, he hides him in the cleft of the rock. And then I think Moses, for the rest of his life, his face shone. Over and over again, Scripture gives us these de 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 depictions of, of this power and magnificence and, and, and awesomeness of God. And it's an, it's an, it's a, it's an awesomeness that we, we, we can't recreate it. You can think about anything. Look, human beings, we, we've done some pretty, pr 
pretty, wow, awesome stuff, right? Like, I mean, look, even when I was a kid, I never thought about something like this, okay? You know, I was watching uh, something uh, the other day uh, about some medical procedures, and I thought, wow, the, the fact that this can happen, and some pretty amazing stuff. But it doesn't compare to this. This is something that we cannot, we cannot recreate this. And so we, we, just, we just stand in awe. If we would but just be still, we stand in awe. And we just take it in and admire it. And yeah, even be overwhelmed. And the picture you're seeing in Scripture when people come into God's presence and their responses, really, that's the only way that any of us can respond. When you take it in, The only way that we can respond is in worship. That's the only adequate response. Such great magnificence and awesomeness. And to think that this is God. And he loves us. We who do not compare. And we seem so insignificant, yet he declares otherwise. Will you just let that sink in for a moment? Isaiah 64 is a scripture that was read earlier. It's actually a psalm of lament. And in Isaiah 64, they're lamenting to God, and they don't just simply want God to acknowledge their story. Their, their, their plight. He doesn't want them to just like, they don't want God just to acknowledge what's happening to them. They want him to do something about it. They want him to, notice the description, rip open, like it were, the curtains of heaven and display his power like he had done in the past. That's why they say this. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence as fire causes wood to burn and water to boil. Your coming would make the nations tremble. That's intense, ain't it? That's not just me. Then, he says, your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And, and oh, how the mountains quaked. They're longing for that to happen again. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you. A God like you who works for those who wait for him. So they want all of the nations of the world, especially those who oppress them, to see the glory and the power of God. And in light of that great power, are you listening? In light of that great power, they actually confess their own sins. They acknowledge their own condition, the things that have made them unclean. That's why they say things like this. We are constant sinners. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? Or they say, even the good that we do is like filthy rags. Even when we do good, it's just like smearing dirt. It's like, you know, trying to clean. You ever try to clean a window with a rag or something and it's dirty itself and you just make it worse? That's the picture here. Even when we try to do good, we're just smearing it around. We're like autumn leaves. We wither and fall and our sins just sweep us away like the wind. So they appeal to this awe-inspiring God. For mercy, they appeal to his mercy as their father. That's why they say, and yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. Now pause to think about that. Seriously, pause to think about that. He, he's our father. 
which means he wants us to see him as our father. This awe-inspiring, all-powerful, immense being. When we see that, we're like, ah! And he wants us to see him with hands stretched out. Oh, yes, all powerful. But as our father, my little girls think I'm the strongest man in the world. Well, I am, but. <laughs> they literally think I've hung the moon. My oldest thought that I could build a rocket ship out of cardboard and we could fly to the moon. My little girls think pretty highly of me. And it's awesome. It is awesome. Still to this day, when I come home, except for Reagan, man, she just locks herself in a room. I, don't, I just don't get it. Still, when I come home, I'm greeted. Even the oldest comes out of the room. Hey, Daddy. When Reagan actually comes out, she's like, oh, hey, Daddy. But the littles, as soon as I open that door, man, they're on it. I hope it never stops. They see me as bigger than life. It's actually pretty humbling because I know me. God wants us to see him the same way. But yet you're our father. So they plead this awe-inspiring father to have mercy on them. They acknowledge, notice, that he has every right to deal with them as he sees fit. That's why they say, but you're the potter, and we're the clay. And essentially, do with us what you will. That's the right perspective. That is the right perspective. That is the spec perspective that we need to reorient ourselves towards. That's what this candle represents. He is our awe-inspiring Father. And He has the power. Look, there is nothing beyond. Nothing the problem is not our belief that God can handle it. The problem is our belief that we are supposed to handle it. That we are supposed to maintain control. But even, notice the picture here. Humble yourself in, in, in light of who he is, seeing who we are. All we can really do is say, we're the clay and you're the potter. And what this text points us to, what this text points out for us is our awe-inspiring Heavenly Father knows our sins. Look, if he's responsible for all this, don't you think he knows you better than you know yourself? And all the false, the false senses and layers and that we create. What this text points out to us is our awe-inspiring family. Father knows our sins. It is sobering. You could fake anybody else out. We do a pretty bad job of that, by the way. But, but not God. But while it's sobering to think that he knows you better than you know yourself, and you know what you know about yourself, and you know what probably is not something you want other people to know. Am I right? Yeah, you feel me? That's why you ain't saying nothing. So while it's sobering yet, man... What it tells us is that he knows. He knows what we need. 
And he, if he is responsible for all this, he can provide exactly what we need to cure the thing that he knows. You know, the thing that's deep down inside of us. And part of him helping us do that, give us what we need, and this amazing display of power, what did he do? The incarnation, he came to earth in the form of a baby. Man, wrap your mind around that in so many ways. It's like he just kind of gave up. You know, because the baby ain't got no control. Look, they can't even determine when they're going to go to the bathroom. Think about that. But in this immense display of power, he comes in the flesh, presented us the path to freedom and transformation while we live in anticipation for his return. So, in the meantime, we turn to him to restore us. Psalm 80, which, by the way, is a part of our daily scripture reading for today. Knowing that he is faithful, 1 Corinthians 3, which, by the way, is also a part of our reading for today. And so we keep watch in anticipation for Jesus is coming again, Mark 13, which, by the way, is also a part of our daily scripture reading today. And so if I might just kind of give a shameless plug, if you are not following our daily reading, which follows the, revised, the common revised lectionary, this is the message. This is one of the great things that you can get from this. You get scripture from old and prophets and epistles and gospels, and there's just there's this thematic message that is there. Let me go over today. If you're not following it, I'm going to encourage you. Go to our website, northpointcofc.org. Click on Daily Readings. It'll drop down as a page with the date and a hyperlink. You click on that hyperlink, which is nothing more than a text that will open up Bible Gateway, and those verses for the day be right there. And look, you, can, you don't even have to read it. It'll read it for you if your translation that you choose has an audio version, and most of them do. These are the scriptures for today. And let me go over that one more time. God knows your sins. He knows who you are. That's Isaiah 64. He knows our sins. He knows who we are. So we need to turn to him, Psalm 80. And when we turn to him, we know that he's faithful, 1 Corinthians 3. And we do this in anticipation for he will return again, Mark 13, because Mark says this. I love this depiction. He says, the sun will be darkened. The moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory and he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world from the furthest ends of the earth and heaven. That's what we are anticipating. That's what we're waiting for. And we're doing it just like those who waited for his first coming. And so in the meantime, part of anticipating that return is us working on our relationship with God. I know that's a phrase that's thrown around a lot. And maybe it's lost its meaning to you, but I want you to challenge you to think about what it actually means. Submitting yourself to the potter's hands is what that means. Submitting yourself to the potter's hands, acknowledging your own sins, leaning it to him, for he is God, magnificent, awesome, and powerful. Let's pray. Father, you put us in awe. Your power is beyond comprehension. We yet are grateful to be able to behold what seems to be a small glimpse of what it's like to be in your presence. And to think, you are faithful to us. Remind us of your faithfulness. Pour on us your love so that we may be refreshed by the coming 
of our Savior. And it's in his name we pray.